The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's live chat. We're so excited that you have joined us. My name is Lakeland Hogan. I am gerontologist and caregiver advocate with Home Instead Senior Care. And again, I want to thank you so much for joining us for today's Alzheimer's live chat. Our live chats are brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care, a network of locally owned franchise offices. The Home Instead Senior Care Network offers in-home care with an individualized approach to keeping your older adult loved ones safe and independent at home. And to learn more, you can visit homeinstead.com. Before we get started on today's important topic, I wanted to go over a couple housekeeping items with you. First and foremost, we have muted all of your lines to reduce the background noise. We want you to be able to still move about your home, uh, maybe do laundry or listen while you're driving. Don't worry, we can't hear you on our end. Um, and then next, if you have any questions, we encourage you to type in your questions at any time. You can start typing them in now. There's a question box on the right-hand side of your screen, and there's no silly questions. Please don't be shy. It's likely that people are also thinking the same exact question that you have. So we'd rather have you ask it a couple different times or a couple different people ask the same question than not ask it at all. So again, as we go through today, as you're hearing about our topic, feel free to type in those questions you might have. And then finally, don't worry about having to take notes. We will be recording today's live chat and we're going to email you back the link. Uh, so you can listen to it again if there was a portion of the live chat that you maybe missed or wanted to listen to again. Maybe you found the information really exciting, interesting, wanted to pass it along to a colleague, family member, friend, you certainly can do so. Uh, so again, we will be recording this chat and sending it back out to you. Uh, so that really takes care of all of our housekeeping items. So let's move on to today's topic. We will be talking today about relationship-centered dementia care. This type of care is really being embraced in the dementia community, and we are very lucky to have with us today an expert on this topic. We're going to be talking about a lot of different things, of course, relationship-centered care, but we're also going to talk a little bit about what people with memory loss, what they need most uh, from their care partners. We're also going to discuss different caregiving techniques and tools, and then also talk about, uh, you know, defining the role as a care partner. A lot, and a lot of other topics that will come up through the questions that you ask. So without further ado, our expert for today is David Troxel. David is an internationally known expert in Alzheimer's disease and memory care. He has worked for over 25 years in the Alzheimer's care field, developing and teaching care techniques as a consultant, writer, and speaker. He co-authored the book, The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care, along with many other influential books, and resources related to Alzheimer's care and training. And David actually has been a key member of our Home Instead team as we developed our outstanding Alzheimer's training for our professional caregivers that we employ. So David was very instrumental in helping us develop that uh, because he is, again, such an expert on this topic. So uh, with that, David, thank you so much for being here today and welcome. Well, thank you, Lakeland. Thank you very much. And David, to get us started with today's chat, I know sometimes we jump right into questions, but some people on the call, they might not be familiar with what relationship-centered dementia care is or what it means. So to get us started, would you mind just kind of outlining what relationship-centered dementia care is and why it's so important and why it's kind of becoming the more adopted practice in the Alzheimer's and dementia space? Well, thank you very much, Lakeland, and thank you, everybody, on the call. You know, I've been in the field for many years, and I was just speaking with some friends the other day saying I, I really had hoped that I'd actually be out of business by now, you know, that we would have long discovered a, a really effective treatment or a cure for Alzheimer's and these other dementias. But much to my disappointment, Lakeland, and, and much to the disappointment of so many of us who've been family members ourselves, you know, we're struggling to find a pill, a medicine that will really impact this disease. I think now it's been over 13 years since we've had a new FDA approved drug for Alzheimer's disease. That, that is really pretty catastrophic, uh, particularly when we know that this disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the U.S., affects one in three families. 
So I was at a conference the other day, Lakeland, and uh, a caregiver came up to me and said, you know, what now? What now? And, and, I, and I think the, the good news is that we actually do know a lot about how to help the person with Alzheimer's disease or these other dementias live the best life they can be, they, they can. And I think in many ways, this idea of living well with dementia is something that we, we want to spend some time on, even on this call and, and as we move forward. So the truth is, without this magic pill, how do we help people with dementia? Well, I think the treatment is you and me. It's the environment, it's the activities, it's the engagement, it's our relationship with the person with dementia, whether we're an adult child or a spouse or partner, whether we're a staff member, you know, how can we interact with that person, be in a relationship with them where we know and use their life story, Lakeland, where we uh, help them feel safe, secure and valued, where we enjoy the day, and in my own philosophy, what, what the person really needs is a best friend, is someone to travel this journey with them. And when you help this person, you know, be active and do everything they can, when you give lots of compliments and, 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 and give this sort of warmth, this emotional warmth, I think it reduces some of the behaviors that are challenging, fosters happiness, fights depression, and ultimately helps this person be the best they can be. So we, for many years, I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with a, a phrase coined by this renowned British researcher, Tom Kitwood. And Dr. Kitwood talked about person-centered care, which I, I do think is very profound, this idea that you look at the person with dementia, what are their needs, what are their remaining strengths, and really try to you know, focus on those and lift them up. Uh, I've evolved, along with my co-author, Virginia Bell, to uh, embrace these principles of person-centered care, but spin it a little bit differently, that it's about the relationship between you and the person. Again, the fact that maybe I might give my mother a nice compliment, which cheers her up, and in, in turn, she might compliment me back, which cheers me up. So it, these are some of the new ideas, some of the contemporary views of dementia today. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us, David. Um, and I know a lot of people um, that I work with have read your book and uh, really find value in the best friends approach. And everybody, like you said, wants the best friend, somebody uh, that knows them, knows their likes, their preferences. And as care partners in uh, caring for someone with dementia, we can really use um, what we we know about them in terms of our best friend relationship or our relationship-centered care, like you mentioned, to help provide better care uh, to them. So uh, I think that it's a great topic for today. Um, so I'm excited to dive into some questions. And again, if you're on listening on the call and if you have a question for David, please feel free to write in your question at any time. Uh, there's a question box on the right-hand side. No such thing as a silly question, so please be sure to um, ask away. Um, and I know that, David, you talked about, and this might get us a little bit off topic, but it's very timely. Um, so you talked about how there's really hasn't been um, a newly discovered drug in many years, and it can sometimes be discouraging. But this week, um, Bill Gates, the wealthiest person in America, just announced that um, he's going to be investing, uh, you know, $50 million from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation into Alzheimer's research, and another 50 million is coming uh, from him in one way or another. So about 100 million dollars invested in research. And I was talking to somebody, and they referred to this as a good shot in the arm for dementia research. So any thoughts on that? Do you? Um, I feel like this ha is encouraging and exciting. It's really a lot of buzz happening around it. Yeah, that may be the ultimate GoFundMe campaign, $100 million, not too bad, even if it's just one person. Well, certainly the idea of it being a shot in, in the arm is huge because uh, the fact that someone of his prominence, uh, first and foremost, I think spoke very much from the heart that this has touched his family and different, uh, he said, men in his family. Uh, we, we know that Alzheimer's... Um, you know, it doesn't matter, Lakeland, whether you're rich or poor, you know, what kind of work you've done. It's an equal opportunity uh, villain in so many ways, isn't it? So the fact that uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, is putting some of his personal prestige and money is so exciting. My understanding is that he's going to be looking at some, you know, maybe unconventional ideas and, and, and thoughts that maybe haven't had uh, uh, mainstream funding. 
But I, I do think um, that it's very, very encouraging. Uh, you know, I had a chance uh, several years ago, I don't go every year, but the big international uh, research conference moves around the world. I think you've probably been to them over the years, Lakeland. Uh, this last year was in London, the year before in Washington, is coming back to Chicago next summer. Uh, but at this conference in DC a couple years ago, I think there was something like 5,000 attendees, some enormous number. And, and just walking the halls like when I was so encouraged because it looked like about 25% of them were under the age of 30, you know, these young PhDs, <laughs> MDs, PhD candidates, all devoting their careers to dementia research. So, you know, I, I do think we shouldn't be uh, discouraged. I think we may find um, that some of the medicines have already been studied. Maybe they were giving to the wrong people at the wrong time. But I, I, I do believe that uh, Bill Gates, along with the great work of the Alzheimer's Association, we're going to see some tremendous strides. Meanwhile, again, what do we have? Well, uh, this relationship-centered care idea, I wanted to take a moment uh, and, and just share a few tips around life story work. Um, you know, Lakeland, uh, I think it's so powerful if you are a family member to make sure that the people around your, your mom or dad or whoever it is know a lot about them. And I thought I'd share with you that, you know, I've been a care partner myself to my mother, Dorothy, who passed away in 2009. My mother was Canadian. She spoke fluent French. She was sort of very proper and loved, you know, uh, you know, high society, afternoon tea parties, things like that. But very notably, she'd had a lifelong tradition of loving Earl Grey tea with milk. And mm -hmm. I, I reflect back on, on her, her time when we had an in-home uh, caregiver when uh, she ended up at, at, a, at a you know really good uh, assisted living program, uh, that when she was having a bad day, like when, you know, if the care partner said, Dorothy, how about I pour you a nice cup of Earl Grey tea with milk just the way you like it? And it was extraordinary how that one gesture, you know, evoked this old ritual. It helped my mother feel known and uh, and connected. And it would turn things around about 95% of the time. So I, I can't stress enough, particularly in this holiday season, it's a great time to, to write a little mini memoir about your mom or dad, to write a little top 10 card for those of you on the call who work in a, in a program, you know, re-embrace this life story work. Uh, it, it's very powerful to be able to kind of reminisce and connect with people, particularly if they're having a bad day. If someone's at a back gate, and they want to leave, they what they think they're late for work. You know, if we know nothing about them, how do we redirect them from that back gate, you know, where they might walk off into traffic? But if I know that someone was famous for their pumpkin cheesecake recipe, I could ask them for that advice. How, how did you make that great pumpkin cheesecake and maybe get them away from the gate? So again, with relationships, knowing life story is very powerful. And another suggestion I have for the people on the phone call. And this is a tough one because sometimes many of us as care partners are pretty exhausted and beaten up in many, many ways, hopefully not physically, but at least emotionally. But I do think the person with dementia is very sensitive to the mood of the room. Um, you want to work your best to smile, to, to have this warmth, engagement, um, welcomed hugs, things like that. Because if you're, as a care partner, dejected, you know, depressed, if you're struggling, the person feels that. And this is when it's time to get some help, you know, to go to that support group, to use that great day center, to find someone lively and engaging to be in the house or to find a lovely memory care neighborhood or community and assisted living. Because again, um, you can't do it all. And you want to be aware of the fact that, that that environment is very important for the person. Those are all great tips and uh, advice that you've given. And I, I love, the, the example that you gave about your mom and her tea. Um, I mean, that's something so simple that uh, unless you had heard about this relationship-centered care, um, you might not even think, you know, that uh, something that she used to love and enjoy every day would be something that would, through her dementia journey, still bring her comfort and familiarity um, to somebody who uh, might be feeling a little anxious or um, feeling like they're you know, losing familiar surroundings or whatnot, that cup of tea really can make a big difference. So thank you for sharing that. And we did have somebody write in, um, her name is Chris. And I know that with Alzheimer's disease, a lot of times people, as they lose their memories, um, they sometimes will think maybe they're living in a different era or 
maybe their loved one that has been deceased for many years is still living. So Chris writes in and she says, how do I answer my mother when she constantly asks to see her parents, which are deceased? Do you have any tips or advice for Chris on, on this particular question, David? Boy, Lakeland, I think that's a question I probably get asked almost every time at, I'm at a conference. I know my, my colleague, Virginia Bell, who I write my books with, always, we, we've talked about this so many times. Years ago, um, you, you'd read an article and it would say, oh, just make something up. They'll forget about it later. Just tell them what they want to hear in the moment. And you know, that never felt quite right to me, this idea of just kind of creating this complete fiction and just you know, being very bold and, and not telling the truth. Um, and, and I think we've evolved in a very positive way. Uh, so let me, let me attack that question in a couple of different directions, Lakeland, because there's not necessarily one answer for Chris. But Chris, here are a couple ideas. Number one, uh, today, I, I've, I've evolved where I, I like to start with the truth. You know, if I know the person well, I wouldn't just do this to, you know, someone I'd never met before in assisted living. But if, if it were my own mother, I might say something like, gosh, mother, grandmother, your mother, isn't it something? She, she died about 10 years ago. Isn't that something? And then I would say, comma, didn't she make the best banana cream pie? <laughs> Now, what I'm doing there is being authentic, telling the truth, but I'm kind of reframing it with a happy memory. Hopefully there are some happy memories. And, and perhaps we'll talk about her pie recipes and giggle and smile, and, and, and there'll be kind of a, a happy place for that. Now, let's say my mother's upset, Lakeland, or to Chris, who, who asked the question, and let's say she's cheerful. Well, the contemporary view of dementia is people with dementia are just like the rest of us. And you know, it's nothing's wrong. It's nothing wrong about being sad occasionally or being tearful, particularly if you're thinking about the death of a, of a loved relative. So, so option one is, you know, give that a shot. Try to come up with a happy memory. And, and let's say, though, an hour later, she says, where is mother? Obviously, you don't want to go through that whole thing again. So one of the very interesting techniques that I've, I've had good luck with is to, to ask some questions, you know, where's mother? Where's mother? Gosh, I'm, you know, hey, tell me a bit about your mother. Now remind me, is she blonde or brunette? Um, is she a good cook? When, when you were little, did she sew your clothes? Uh, was she very strict when you started dating? And, and almost kind of ask some, some open-ended and broad questions. And sometimes I find, uh, Chris, that if you, if you kind of let them talk about it, it almost touches their spirit, touches their heart, helps them have that kind of emotional connection. And then maybe you can say something, you know, it's a little bit of a finesse, but gosh, you know, I'm not really sure where mom is right now, but I bet she's in a wonderful place. Some, something like that. Uh, Lakeland, what, what are your thoughts on that from your experience? Yeah, I, um, I, I really like the examples that you presented, David. And I had never really even considered, um, you know, a couple of the pieces of advice that you have given, but I, I think that you um, you really hit the nail on the head when you talked about kind of redirecting to a happy memory, because uh, mm -hmm. again, it's about kind of providing that sense of comfort. Um, and to them, their parents probably uh, were comforting to them. I mean, my, I love my parents dearly, and you know, if um, I'm ever sad, I usually call my mom, you know, <laughs> uh, to talk to her about it. So, um, I think that that's a great, great idea. And I've heard some people have some success um, talking or when they figure out that, you know, um, their, their mother was a stay at home mom. Many, many um, mothers in that era were likely a stay at home mom. Sometimes people would say, well, you know, she might be getting dinner ready. What were some favorite things that she made for dinner that you loved? Something of that sort. So again, kind of spinning it back to those positive memories. But I really like the suggestions mm -hmm. that you gave David and hopefully Chris you will find those um, to be uh, some good new techniques to use with your mother. Um, is it okay with you David we have a few more questions that are that's, coming that's in new. and again yes. wonderful yes and, and if any of you listening have a question please don't hesitate to type it in um, and this is interesting question David and I hear this uh, from time to time that family caregivers struggle with Jean she wrote in and asked how do you break through 
the family's denial about an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis. And I know you mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, the holidays are coming up. People are likely to be spending quite a bit of time with their family. Um, so if they're in denial of an Alzheimer's diagnosis or, you know, um, we've all seen uh, in a person with dementia that maybe one day they're functioning really well and the next day they might not be in. It could be, you know, that family's always around on those good days, but they never quite see the bad days. Uh, or right. the challenging days, I should say. So do you have any advice for Jean on how she can um, help her family understand what their loved one is going through? Sure, a couple thoughts I have. It is, it is extraordinary. You know, so often people who have dementia, when the relative comes in from out of town, the son comes in for his once a year visit, they can put on like on an Academy Award winning performance, can't they? It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> they sure yeah, they, can. They really can rise to the occasion. Um, and, and I've seen some people who, who really uh, do an amazing, uh, amazing job. There's also one of my favorite words, you know, this be that little word trivia for the webinar here. I love the word confabulation, confabulation, which many people with dementia do. You know, uh, maybe someone wanders away from their house and you say, well, mother, where did you go? And she might say, well, this young man in a red Ford Mustang convertible picked me up and we went to Lou's drive-in and had a soda and we did this and he was blonde and he was wearing a red shirt. And maybe none of that's true, but they kind of confuse these old memories and new memories and they confabulate. So it is, it is really something. Um, you know, I was speaking to someone recently and, and their sister has Alzheimer's and she was telling a whole group about all of her current clients she has and they all believed it, that she really still had clients. So, so I think one is just to recognize that they're not, you know, being deliberately deceitful, but they just, you know, are living their life and they have their own filters and seeing things that way. Um, but let me get serious for a moment and, and sort of give you my idea about denial. Number one, I think particularly with a spouse, like, you know, sometimes maybe the, you know, you're the adult child and your mother has dementia, your father won't use services, he's in denial. Well, I think provide education, try to get dad to a support group, try to encourage him to, you know, be on a webinar or read a book or go to a conference. I, sometimes you do have to just kind of wait denial out. You know, the person with Alzheimer's has a, a dementia that is progressive. And sooner or later, I think most of the family members will get on board because, you know, if mom walks out of the house at two in the morning and ends up at Walmart um, in her bathrobe, that's pretty hard to ignore. But to be more proactive, uh, Lakeland, one of the things I like is to get a neuropsychological evaluation. Uh, if you take your family member to a neuropsychologist, sometimes they'll even do a home visit or visit an assisted living a neuropsychologist will do a full evaluation. You know, they'll talk to them, they'll give them words and ask them to repeat them back. They'll have them draw a clock face. Uh, they'll they'll ask them to name as many animals in a, in a zoo as you can. And from this very sophisticated, evidence-based kind of approach, the doctor can actually write a three, four, five-page letter. Dear family, you know, I met Mary Jo Smith, you know, who presented as a healthy 77 year old. And here's what happened. And when you get this five or six page report, uh, Gene, uh, from a neuropsychologist, which Medicare covers, um, you know, it really can be something you can share with the family. It's very hard to stay in that state of denial when an outside expert says your mother thinks President Eisenhower's in the White House and she thinks she's 45, not 85. So that would be one definite tip. Uh, now, otherwise, just, you know, hang in there, uh, keep gently, you know, talking to your family members, encourage them to get some support. Uh, sooner or later, the denial will go away. So those are great tips. I think um, the suggestion of seeking outside medical professional uh, diagnosis or um, evaluation, I should say, uh, is an, uh, it can be a really useful tool for families and it can also, um, over time, you can continue to track your loved one's um, usual decline in, in memory too if they continue to see that, that medical professional for a re regular evaluations over the years. So it can also ensure that they're getting the medical care they need to, and help with that uh, professional diagnosis, which like you mentioned, can help family members become more accepting. Uh, and I've also heard, um, you know, if it's in some extreme cases, 
um, the primary caregiver, and maybe it's Jean, uh, she might ask one of her loved ones to stay with uh, their mom or their dad for the weekend uh, to see, you know, what, what is really going on. Um, and sometimes that also can help when, when the loved one is there for a couple days um, and they're starting to see the forgetfulness over time and not just in the couple hours that they visit or, or whatnot. So hopefully those can all be some tips for Jean to try with, with her current situation. And Jean, we wish you the best of luck. I know it can be hard without that family support. So thank you, Jean, for that question. And Lake, and I'll we, add, and also oh, yeah. for Jean, I'll just add real quick that, you know, certainly one thing many care partners have done is keep a little diary, uh, keep some notes. And if you know your mother is going to the doctor, you know, fax or email a note to the nurse, the doctor, because again, I mean, sadly, how, how many how much time do you have with your doctor these days? Six, eight, ten minutes. And so you want to be sure to uh, give the doctor a heads up that something's going on. That is a great, great point. And families can also use that um, same kind of a journaling process to um, just jot down the things that work. Like we've been mentioning the different tips and techniques, the different personal memories that they can use in the care for their loved ones. So that can be another great way to kind of document those things. Like you had mentioned, David, writing kind of a memoir of sorts. So that journaling can really solve um, or serve, pardon me, serve as um, a great resource tool for the family in a variety of ways. So thank you for that suggestion, David. Um, and we did just have Matt write in. Uh, he asked, what advice do you have for sundowning hours when a client or family member becomes so irritable over the smallest gestures, such as picking up a Kleenex to throw it away? Uh, so David, any thoughts, uh, tips, advice sure. for Matt? Well, this phrase sundowning goes way back, I think, to the 80s, and it, it implies that, you know, there have been different definitions, but that basically as the sun is going down late in the day, often behaviors spike. And, you know, there have been people who have very, very evolved theories that it's with the cycle of the sun and the moon and all that. My take is I think people get a little tired. You know, a lot of people, they, they, they've been working so hard to keep it together. You know, having dementia and having to make it through the day and you know navigate your world can be so stressful and difficult and I think people just get a little bit fatigued exhausted of course when the light is dimming they may not see as well there may be shadows all of that so a couple of thoughts I have I think one is as as in any behavior look for triggers you know see if maybe it does happen at a certain time of day or you know maybe when the grandkids have come over there's a bit too much uh, hubbub and noise um, I love creating an afternoon ritual, so having um, maybe a little afternoon, you know, happy hour with or without alcohol, uh, having an afternoon tea, um, perhaps putting on some lovely music. If the person's always loved classical music or opera or even country western, putting on music. Um, Virginia Bell and her wonderful adult day program in Kentucky, uh, I think it's so brilliant. They actually have ice cream cones around 3 o'clock. They've done it every day in their day program for over 30 years, this, this wonderful program that helped launch the whole best friends philosophy. And, you know, Virginia pointed out to me once that, you know, when you're having an ice cream cone, it's very hard to be angry and depressed. Uh, an ice cream cone evokes those uh, emotions and feelings of childhood. And a neurologist friend of mine said that looking reflex is sort of the last one of the last to go. They're, they're having to attend to the ice cream cone. So that might be the most important suggestion of the whole webinar, a very high tech ice cream cone. But it really can be a guerrilla tactic uh, for uh, sundowning or for when things are going wrong. That is a great tip. I, who, you're right. Who doesn't like ice cream? <laughs> so, yeah, I love how you mentioned creating an activity or ritual around that time. Um, and I, I like how you phrased it as well, or your observation that around that, what we have heard traditionally called sundowning time, that uh, it just might be, you know, fatigue. So uh, we, keep in, we have to keep, I think, in mind as care partners that, um, you know, this person, their, their brain's having to work overtime because there's their brain, Alzheimer's or dementia is a disease of the brain. So their brain's having to work extra hard. So I, if my brain had to work that hard all day too, I'd probably get a little grouchy around, around the afternoon time. So uh, a great perspective there, David. Uh, and you had mentioned Virginia Bell. I know she's the co-author of your book, The Best Friends Approach. And you have recently come out with 
uh, a second edition of that. So would you mind just telling us briefly um, a little bit about that new book that you have? Oh, out? thank you. Thank you, Lakeland. You know, our very first book was, came out about 20 years ago from Health Professions Press called The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care. And uh, when Virginia and I wrote that book, you know, it was it was really the, one of the first books out there to kind of take a more positive approach to say that even though dementia can be so devastating that, you know, there may be some ways we can really lift the person up and, and, and come through this care partner experience, you know, stronger and more connected and, and, you know, using music and life story work and empathy and great communication. And much to our pleasure, like, when the, the book, you know, I think I think it hit at the right time. People were ready for a new message, and the book has now been used all over the world. So Virginia and I have lightly revised this book throughout the whole, you know, 20 years. Um, we also published a family edition called A Dignified Life, uh, which is from a press called Health Communications in Florida. Uh, but it came time to really do a major reboot, so we we worked for about two years. Put a lot of new stories in and the new book the best friends approach to dementia care available on amazon and other booksellers uh the new book has about 60 percent new content and we've aimed it more for professionals so it, it's for for cnas for activity directors it, it, it you know administrators nurses social workers and the book is basically you know what is the best friends philosophy and how to make it work in your care setting so uh, for a company like Home Instead, you know, I know you all embrace the book. In fact, you're all featured in the book uh, as a best practice. Uh, and, you know, just ideas about how to kind of, you know, get traction, how to sustain your programs, how to get these things going, how to motivate the staff, how to work with families. There's even a chapter on volunteerism and how to get that in your setting. So delighted to be, uh, thanks for letting me put the plug in. Uh, my co-author, Virginia Bell, uh, sends her greetings to everybody. She's now 95, uh, still thriving, working in Lexington and working, uh, traveling, teaching, uh, working at her amazing day program. And she still goes to Pilates three days a week and runs. So she's a great example of healthy aging. Wow, that is incredible. Well, thank you for sharing about your book. I know that many people have found your first edition helpful. So I'm excited myself to pick up your new edition and to read all the new stories. And um, I know that if people on the call might find it helpful. Of course, they can uh, hit up Amazon. Uh, to to get the latest copy. So thank you for that. Um, and we did have another question come in. Um, this question is from Jackie. She says that her spouse has a PD dementia, which I'm guessing is Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, he has developed a great deal of distrust for me, accusing me of affairs, helping people steal from him, and trying to put him away. Um, oh she says she feels like she's on the defense all the time, she tries to change the subject, but he has caught on to that technique, um, and it's hard for her to keep her cool, um, especially after hours and hours of these types of accusations. So, oh gosh, our heart goes out to you, Jackie. That seems like a challenging situation. David, do you have any suggestions for Jackie? Yes, Jackie. Sounds like she's tried the redirection, but maybe it's time for a new technique. Yeah. Well, Jackie, I, I will say that, you know, sometimes even the best caregivers become the bad guy. You know, we don't really always know why, but, you know, you're the pair, you're the person there kind of in the trenches, having to say no, having to na navigate things. And your husband may not be aware of his losses and challenges. So when you take away his car keys or take away his checkbook, you know, he, he may really legitimately be paranoid thinking you're trying to hurt him in some way. So compounding that, there's a word that I want you all to uh, know. Uh, it, the word is called a delusion, D-E-L-U-S-I-O-N, a delusion, very common with dementia. And it has a great definition that I like. It's a fixed false idea. A delusion is a fixed false idea. So sometimes people with dementia do get these delusions, you know, that, you know, you're having multiple affairs or that the neighbors have moved the fence in three feet, three feet to steal their land. And so this is this is a tough situation. So, uh, Jackie, um, while you're in the midst of this, since he has this you know, vision of you as a bad guy, uh, I hate to say this, but, you know, you may not be able to change that overnight. So I think in, if I were in your shoes, I think I would try to give myself some respite or a break. Uh, I want you to maybe find a, a great day program and tell him that it's doctor's orders. You know, the doctor has prescribed this, you know, kind of exercise rehab program. 
uh, get someone in the home uh, and you can say, hey, I've hired someone to help me around the house, but at least they could be there to potentially be with him. This also might be a time to think about assisted living, maybe for a respite break. Uh, what I find is sometimes if you give yourself a bit of distance, give yourself a bit of a break, maybe have an adult child who you could go stay with for a little while, sometimes you can almost kind of make a fresh start uh, in, in, in a little later. Um, if there's some good news here, Jackie, um, these delusions can kind of go away uh, on their own. So if you don't overreact, I would not argue with him, try to correct him, plead with him. You can apologize, say, honey, I'm so sorry that I'm not doing things well. I'll try to do better. But if you have a light touch, try to just let him work through this. Uh, perhaps a month from now, you'll be his best friend again. Thank you, David. Those are some great suggestions. Um, and Jackie, there's also this uh, really great app out there. It's called the Daily Companion app. And that also might be helpful in giving you some additional resources and tips. And I'll share where you can download that app here in just a little bit. You can type in uh, kind of ac word, keywords like accusations, hallucin hallucinations, or delusions, you know, that term that David just shared. And um, so if you're trying those suggestions David um, just brought up, but want, and, and maybe some of them are working, maybe some aren't. Uh, there's also that app that could provide you with even more suggestions uh, on there. So again, our heart goes out to you, Jackie, and we hope that those tips can be useful to you um, and, and your husband in this situation. Uh, and so thanks to Jackie and Matt for writing in those questions. If you have questions, we still have about 20 minutes left, so we gladly take your questions. Um, there's no such thing as a silly question. So, um, and David, we did have one come in um, from Nancy. We talked a lot about, uh, at the beginning of the call, we talked about how there's not an Alzheimer's, hasn't been a new Alzheimer's or dementia drug in quite some time. We talked about relationship-centered care and how we can use what we know about the person um, and our relationship we build with them to help um, with the symptoms that present during um, the progression of Alzheimer's and dementia. But Nancy is asking, is there a time when um, you would discontinue the Alzheimer's or dementia medications? And I know I'm not a, a physician, so I can't really speak to this question with great authority, uh, but I was wondering if you maybe just had some tips for Nancy, um, or could maybe speak to when Alzheimer's drugs are useful, um, and do they work you know, over a long period of time, or is, is it really something that might work for a little bit um, and then stop working and it's time to get their loved one off of the medication? Any thoughts there, David? Yes, and thank you for your question, Nancy. Um, the current crop of medicines, there, there are basically four. There's a fifth that's hardly ever used, but um, Aricept, Exelon, Razadine, those first three are called cholinesterase inhibitors. They, they give those neurotransmitters a, a boost. There's a, a fourth drug called Nemenda that's often added later in the game that again, may have some uh, neuroprotective qualities. If you want some fact sheets on those meds, just go to alz.org and they've got lots of good stuff, the Alzheimer's Association website. Um, here's the good news about those medicines. They don't truly have significant side effects, sometimes some vivid dreams or some GI issues. Most people tolerate them very well. But the bad news is that they, they aren't what we call disease modifying. They, they, they may improve your brain's ability to, to, to perform. They kind of give it a boost, but the underlying dementia kind of marches on. So I do recommend the drugs. I think, you know, overall, my own kind of anecdotal experience and talking to other doctor, uh, talking to doctors, I'm not a physician, talking to doctors, uh, probably about a third of the people on these memory care medicines have a nice boost up. Maybe another third kind of keeps them status quo uh, longer, which is a really good success if they're not going downhill. And the final third, um, you know, probably not much impact. So you can take a look on the web, read some reputable websites, but again, conventional wisdom is that these medicines have kind of done their work probably after about 18 months, 24 months. Uh, there's no harm in leaving somebody on the medicines, but after a year and a half, two years, you, you probably have seen everything you're going to see. So it may also be a, a financial piece. One, one friend of mine is very interesting. Uh, she was feeling so nervous and uptight about taking her dad off these medicines because, you know, she was fearful of it. 
but she finally realized that, you know, the evidence was, was there that after two years or so, that was about right. So she took the several hundred dollars a month she was saving and actually hired someone to go spend some extra time with him in the house. And someone would walk with him and exercise. She found somebody who, who loved to exercise. So you could take that money and maybe hire a music therapist or hire a physical uh, tr uh, personal trainer to come in or, or use it to supplement other ways. And that might be very good for the brain as well. That's, those are some great suggestions there, David, and I'll share that ALZ.org link again uh, here at the end of the presentation. Um, so those are some of the more well-known pharmaceutical treatments out there, but David, I've heard you talk before about how social, socialization can be a treatment for dementia. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's probably something that um, people don't hear enough about um, and how that can help. Uh, thank you, Lakeland. Uh, yes, it, there, there's an evidence base for this and also just a common sense basis for this that boredom is the enemy. <laughs> uh, I, I think that it's so important when someone has forgetfulness, confusion, memory loss, that you keep them active and engaged in life. So I love to say socialization in so many ways is the treatment for dementia. And, and where I got this sort of first idea was, was really from my early years with Virginia Bell uh, in Lexington at the Adult Day Program uh, back in the 1980s, so long ago. Uh, but we, uh, we started one of the first day programs in the country and, and we started off really just to give the caregivers a break but we discovered that the people coming to the day center, they um, they, they they just lit up with the, the the attention. They enjoyed the activities, the music, the conversation, and and we were able to create this sort of therapeutic environment, an environment that's healing. So I know many of you have different places from all over the country and all over the world on this phone call. A couple of tips I have for you. I think number one is if you are caring for someone on your own, you know, try to build in some fun to the day. Uh, go for a drive and, you know, see the sights, see the Christmas lights. They'll be coming up pretty soon. Uh, drive um, to a drive-in. And even if you don't want to get out of the car, find a place where maybe they'll deliver the burgers to your car where you can have that. Uh, music, you know, music and song lyrics live in a different part of the brain than words and language. So music is so therapeutic, and I think that can be very powerful. Um, if you uh, feel that you're not able to provide this, um, I want you to find somebody to come in the home, but not just somebody to watch TV all day. Uh, as Lakeland mentioned at the beginning of the, of the webinar, I was so delighted to be part of Home Instead's uh, training program, and 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 that is all through the training that you know a caregiver coming to the home needs to talk to people, reminisce, look at the old scrapbooks, and you know keep the person engaged and lively and active, and you know go for a walk in the neighborhood and put on uh, an old Lawrence Welk DVD or something fun to kind of entertain them because again that builds this friendship. Uh, again, socialization through a day program. This is one reason why we have so many wonderful assisted living communities out there now is because, again, people with dementia benefit from being in community. A couple of very specific tips related to the holiday season coming up, uh, Lakeland. Uh, I'm a big fan of kind of embracing whatever holiday traditions uh, your family has. So wrapping presents with your mother, uh, you know, writing cards out, uh, even if she can't write anymore, she might enjoy just, you know, having you sit with her while you're writing your holiday cards. Old recipes, maybe grandmother has a great recipe for brisket that you want to embrace. Uh, spiritual readings, prayers, music, you know, going to services, uh, the smells, the sounds of the holiday. Uh, whatever your religious practice is, I think seeing all the wonderful, you know, most cities have a street or two with all the holiday lights, all of that can be very, very powerful. So use this holiday time as a, as a time for some activities and engagement uh, as well. And that can kind of, again, I think help fight depression, help the person feel very connected. Uh, maybe even if your mom and you always have loved dogs, bake some, bake some uh, dog biscuits for the local animal shelter and deliver them. Uh, anything you can do to be in community, enjoying life, living life is to me the treatment for dementia. Those are all such great suggestions. Um, I, I love all of those. So thank you so much for sharing, David. Um, we do have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, Cindy wrote in, and it sounds like the individual she's talking about might be in the early stage of dementia because she's noticing um, that 
she doesn't live with the person, but when she talks to them on the phone, they repeat questions over and over. And she so far answers them kind of like it's the first time. Uh, but she says, do I confront them that I've answered that same question several times already? And when do I suggest that they go to see a doctor? So it seems like uh, she's asking, you know, at what point uh, and how do you go about uh, getting help for a family member who might be exhibiting these signs of dementia? Okay, thank you. Great question. And I, and I will say that, you know, I, I'm sure for many of us on this on this webinar, patience is so hard sometimes, you know, yeah. trying to have this sort of sense of patience for all of us. Um, but, you know, uh, one of the early signs of dementia is forgetfulness. Uh, there is a diagnosis called mild cognitive impairment, MCI. You can look that up uh, where it can kind of be a precursor in a sense toward Alzheimer's where people are doing pretty well, getting dressed, ordering up the menu, maybe even driving, paying their bills, but they have this profound forgetfulness. I guess a couple of thoughts I have is I do encourage going to the physician. Uh, someone might have a irreversible dementia, but they might also have a B12 deficiency, or maybe they're taking their medicines all wrong. Uh, it generally does not work to say, mother, you've called me seven times. I've answered this six times. No, your appointment is not today. Uh, so that can be very tough. Um, so again, maybe gently redirect them if they call and, and, and ask you about the doctor's appointment and say, mom, tell me about the doctor and you know, what is his office like? Is he nice? Sometimes if you get them talking about it, it can break the cycle. Otherwise, I have to say, you know, this kind of comes with the territory. Uh, perhaps they are anxious and that's one reason why they're, they're asking the question many times. So again, music, uh, redirecting to a favorite life story. Mom, tell me about growing up on that wheat farm in Walla Walla, Washington. That what a wonderful life you had, and you're know, talking about that. Um, yeah, I mentioned music. Sometimes um, a snack or food break, things like that, can be very, very helpful. But certainly, this repeated questions. You know, certainly we see this like in assisted living. You know, somebody comes down to the concierge desk and asks the same question 20 times during the day. It's it's a sign that it's time to get a good medical evaluation, see what's going on. Again, if they're early on. Perhaps a really good exercise program, which is good for the brain, um, some social activity, maybe along with Aricept or one of the cholinesterase inhibitors, it might give them that extra boost to break this cycle. Those are great suggestions, and we hope that that is helpful to you, Cindy. Um, it's always challenging and sometimes can be kind of scary to take that first step in helping your loved one get evaluated or taking that first step to approach their medical provider. but. Um, it, it can, um, it, you can do it, <laughs> you know, you don't, don't feel um, intimidated. It's going to be in the best in interest of your loved ones. So uh, we just encourage you, Cindy, in your situation, and we hope that those pieces of advice were helpful. Um, we do have another question come in. They're kind of flooding in right now in the last couple minutes, so I want to make sure we can get to uh, some of the remaining questions. But Julie has asked, um, what tips for, what are tips? for appropriately detaching emotionally to the person, um, for the one who's caring full time? Um, how does one reduce expectations so personal hits to the caregiver are not so great? So sounds like uh, maybe this individual is saying things that are hurtful um, mm -hmm. to uh, the care provider, and this person is with them full time, and it can be emotionally draining. Um, mm -hmm. Are there any tips that you have, David? I know it's really hard to detach emotionally, um, but I know you've talked about, you know, respite is a great way to do that. Uh, you mentioned that earlier as a tip, but any additional thoughts there for Julie? Sure. Well, one thing I like to find out, I mean, at least can help us a bit is, you know, has your family member always been this way? You know, sometimes someone's always been kind of critical and negative and difficult. And, you know, if they if they have always been that way and they're that way now, that can be very challenging. Um, but in general, of course, what I always want to remind people is that, you know, if, if someone says something mean or hurtful, um, they pinch you, uh, you know, I like to say it's the disease talking, not the person. You know, it, it must be so frustrating and difficult to not always know where you are and what's happening around you. Um, so, you know, do your best to um, be aware of this up front. You know, if I'm going to someone's house or visiting them, 
in their room and assisted living, you know, I, I want to say, hi, my name's David. It's good to see you. I'm your friend, you know, and sort of explain why I'm there. Uh, again, reminisce from their life story. You know, Margaret, um, I hear you make the best pumpkin pie. Would you teach me how to make that or something like that? Or talk to them about their, their love of dogs or cats or quilting. Um, you know, give them as much autonomy as you can because people do get frustrated if they feel they're being bossed around. So, you know, I might say to you, Lakeland, Lakeland, do you want to wear the blue sweater today or the red sweater versus me telling you what to do? Um, give lots of compliments, you know, and, you know, about their past or what they're doing. Um, I like to sort of help them feel more in charge. So one of my kind of bag of tricks ideas is I'll ask them an opinion, like with my mother, when she lived in memory care, I would bring in frop, pardon me, I would bring in five dress shirts and five neckties on a Monday and say, mom, you know, I have a busy week at work. You're so good at this. Would you help me put my wardrobe together? And she loved it. So anything you can do to break that dynamic, you know, have the person uh, feel like they have some control, that they're in charge, that you value their opinion. That can sometimes change the dynamic. Now, if they're continually picking on you and being very negative, again, um, I, if you can, if it works out, mix it up, perhaps find a different caregiver to come in, have a little respite break yourself, um, do your best. But it, I hate to say it, but it's so true. It doesn't help to argue, to get upset and angry, to accuse your mother of being ungrateful. Um, you know, we can see a broken arm, but we can't see a broken brain. And in this case, the brain is damaged. Alzheimer's or these other dementias uh, are affecting their their judgment. They're making it is making it more dis, they're more disinhibited. And so again, you know, there is that wonderful person we hope beneath this cloak of dementia. But day in and day out, sometimes you get into some ornery and tough situations. Thank you so much, David, for those tips. And we hope that those were helpful. Um, we have another question. I think we'll have time for one, maybe two more. Um, but Cheryl writes in, um, she says, how do I keep my loved one from picking at her face? She does this constantly, even when she's eating. She doesn't realize she's doing it, but it gets, but gets mad when I remind her not to do so. Uh, so there are some concerns. Um, there and she's tried twiddle muffs. I've seen uh, those advertised on online or on a Facebook video or something of that sort. She said, but she will not use them. So I know that sometimes picking can be, um, you know, a symptom that presents in those with all a type mm -hmm. of dementia. So any mm -hmm. suggestions for Cheryl on how she maybe or do you have any other tips or advice um, beyond those twiddle muffs that she's tried and uh -huh. obviously hasn't worked well. Well, I, I liked what you said, Lakeland, about even checking on the internet because you might even just Google that topic and, and see a lot of different ideas. But unfortunately, you know, sometimes this sort of compulsive behavior or, rep, you know, um, behavior with repetition does seem to happen. If it's benign, you know, if she's just touching her face and is not damaging her skin, part of me thinks you just may have to let go of your own concerns about it, even if it's a bit irritating to see your mother doing this. Um, but, you know, there are situations where people are picking at wallpaper or paint or where they're, you know, actually hurting themselves with their skin or something. So in this, in those cases, I mean, certainly if there are any things you could do to keep her busy with her hands, um, you know, mother, look at this, this ball of yarn. It, I don't know how it came unraveled. Would you help me wind it back up? Would you, would you help me fold towels or, you know, um, uh, put together socks, I mean, you know, match socks and, and fold them. Uh, sometimes giving someone some kind of chore, tactile chore with their hands might work. Uh, I've had people put on little gloves and maybe that can break the cycle. If it's really damaging to their health, um, sometimes that is a case where you might want to try a medicine, maybe an anti-anxiety medicine, even though I'm, I'm not a big fan of the psychotropics, but if it, if it is something that might break that cycle. So there are some ideas out there. If it's not hurting her, it just may be a compulsive behavior. You just have to let go of. But obviously try some skin creams. Try to see if there's an issue with her dermatologist maybe. Otherwise, see if you can figure out other uses for her hands. Those are great tips, David. And I wouldn't have thought of a couple of those. So I learned something too. Thank you so much for sharing those. And we hope that those were helpful um, uh, suggestions for you all. Um, and then I think we'll have time for one last question. And David, I know we've, we've approached the um, 
I want to see my mom topic. Maybe their mom has been deceased for a long time. But another question I hear all the time, and I'm sure you do as well, is the question of, I want to go home and see my loved one, my mom, my dad. Um, and so Susan writes in and says that her father is adamant about going home and seeing his mother. We've tried to be truthful. We've also tried to use the, oh, we'll go tomorrow. Uh, and lately, she's even called her younger sister, who pretends to be his mom, so he can talk to her. Uh, so it seems like they've tried a variety of, of, of things. Uh, but Susan's asking, what is the best way to handle this situation? Do you have any other mm -hmm. suggestions for them? Well, congratulations. It sounds like you've already been very creative and trying some things. Um, you know, I I tend to believe that when a person has dementia, you know, you, you, you don't take them literally anymore with their language. Um, maybe he's searching for an old feeling, an emotion, you know, that, that he had years ago, this sort of almost spiritual sense of home. A home and hearth, um, you could probably drive him to his old family house if it still exists. He'd walk in and say, I want to go home. So that's part of that dynamic. Um, I, I, I have to say, just I think continue doing what you're doing. Be reassuring, be comforting. Maybe it's occasionally okay to say, Dad, we're working on it, or oh my goodness, you know, we're, we're doing our best. Um, but, you know, this idea of asking him to tell you more about home, uh, reminiscing about his childhood. Did you live in the city or the country? Um, did you have a vegetable garden? Maybe try to paint a, a more full picture of his memories and that, that might help him feel better. But sadly, he's kind of fixed on this right now. I, I, I almost think you just have to keep doing what you're doing, which sounds like you're, you have a nice spirit about that. And hopefully at a certain point, this desire will diminish. Thank you so much, David. Uh, again, great tips and resources. Uh, for these family caregivers. Um, and unfortunately, that kind of wraps up our time that we have for questions today. I did want to get to that resource slide because uh, I know we've talked about a lot of great resources. Um, of course, the bestfriendsapproach.com is where you can uh, learn more about David and um, Virginia Bell's uh, approach to dementia care. And that's a picture of their second edition book. Again, you can find that on Amazon.com. For more tips and tools and that, that app, that daily companion app that I spoke about, you can visit helpforalzheimersfamilies.com to learn more about that. We also have a great community on Facebook on our Remember for Alzheimer's uh, website. Uh, Home Instead has a book called Confidence to Care. Uh, there's a website there. Also, if you're managing the stresses of caregiving, uh, again, a great resource on caregiverstress.com. If your loved one has a tendency to wander or if you think that that might be um, a symptom that they present down the road, you can visit the missingseniornetwork.com to register your loved one on that site. And then, uh, heaven forbid, uh, your loved one goes missing, you can immediately send out a message to family and friends to help locate your loved one. Uh, and then if you're interested in home and fed services, maybe getting a little respite in the home, please visit homeandfed.com. And finally, um, David mentioned the Alzheimer's Association. They have some great resources at alz.org. Uh, so again, wanted to leave you with all of those fantastic resources. Um, and then I want to invite you to next month's chat. Um, I really enjoyed today's chat. And next month, uh, we will um, our chat will be taking place on December 12th. We're going to try a new time at 12 p.m. Eastern, which would be 11 Central. Um, so we're going to be talking about practical ways uh, for dementia care partners to find respite with our expert, Karen Garner. So please um, sign up for that live chat. Again, we will be sending you a recording of today's uh, live chat. So feel free to send it along to family members, friends, listen to it again. Um, and again, you can register for next month's live chat at our help for Alzheimer's families.com website. So uh, once again, David, thank you so much for, for joining us today. You are such a wealth of knowledge. So well respected in the dementia community. So I just want to thank you for taking time out of your schedule, busy schedule, to join us. And you shared so much great advice. And I know that uh, the listeners today, these family care partners, um, have taken away a lot of great tidbits, as have I. So thank you so much, David. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. And um, we'll talk to you on December 12th. Take good care. Bye.